presidente Bastardos del empresario Bastardos del presidente Bastardos del empresario Bastardos del presidente Hello and welcome to the Untitled Anarchist Seagull channel. I'm your host, as always, an Untitled Anarchist Seagull. Today, we're going to be talking, a couple of days late, about 9-11. No, not that I one. the whole takes about... Looks like six, seven floors were taken out. They hate our freedoms. Our freedom of religion. Our freedom of speech our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. Uh, we did some things that were wrong. We tortured some folks. This one. Santiago, 11 de septiembre de 1973. Teniendo presente, primero, la gravísima crisis económica, social y moral que está destruyendo el país. Segundo, la incapacidad del gobierno para adoptar las medidas que permitan detener el proceso y desarrollo del caos. Tercero, el constante incremento de los grupos armados paramilitares, organizados y entrenados por los partidos políticos de la Unidad Popular. Las Fuerzas Armadas y Carabineros de Chile declaran, primero, que el señor Presidente de la República debe proceder a la inmediata entrega de su alto cargo a las Fuerzas Armadas y Carabineros de Chile. ...por haberse constituido por el momento... Las Fuerzas Armadas y de Orden han actuado en el día de hoy solo bajo la inspiración patriótica de sacar al país del caos que en forma aguda lo estaba precipitando el gobierno marxista de Salvador Allende. La Junta mantendrá el poder judicial y la asesoría de la Contraloría. Las cámaras quedarán en receso hasta nueva orden. Eso es todo. Tal vez sea triste que se haya quebrado una tradición democrática en este continente era larga. Ella es de la República. Después de tres años de soportar el cáncer narcista que nos llevó a un descalabro económico, moral y social que no se podía seguir tolerando por los sagrados intereses de la patria, nos hemos visto obligados a asumir la triste y dolorosa misión que hemos acometido. No... Today I saw a tweet that actually led me to make this. Chilean anarchists today Allende, with his notions of a peaceful transition to social democracy by disarming workers and funneling radical energy into reformism, set the stage for decades-long slugwashing of radical worker movement. Non-Chilean radicals, it was the CIA. The weird thing about this particular critique is I've only ever heard it in English. There is quite a lot of critique of Allende and the Unidad Popular, amongst Chilean anarchists, who, which is basically accounts for almost everyone I know in Chile. If, and while I can't discount somebody possibly uttering this critique uh, there, uh, all I know is I've only ever heard it in English from people who aren't from Chile. There are a couple of problems with that. The main one is the workers were 
basically unarmed to begin with. You can't really disarm the workers unless the workers are armed in the first place. And the only place the workers were in any significant extent armed in Chile between 1970 and 1973 was in right-wing propaganda. There, there was constant harping on this idea that the Cubans and the Russians were bringing in huge amounts of weapons to give to communists so that they could have a full takeover as part of a fake coup instigated by Allende. Uh, this, is, this was right-wing propaganda. The reality was, basically, the entire working class, with very marginal exceptions, was unarmed. Now, what this claim that I hear from English language leftists it relates to is something called the Ley de Control de Armas, the Arms Control Act. Now, there are a couple of things you need to know about the Arms Control Act, apart from the fact that leftists and the working class in general were basically completely unarmed when it was signed. The first is, again, they didn't have the power to veto it. There was literally no legal way that he could avoid signing it. The second is that its main function was not to disarm the workers, because they didn't really have any, and to authorize the armed forces on their own initiative and without the government being able to do anything to stop it, to carry out raids anywhere they wanted. And of course, where they wanted mostly was in working class neighborhoods, at um, worker operated and state owned enterprises and the headquarters of left parties and things like that. And they never found anything. They basically never found any actual arms. And it wasn't really about that. What it was about was psychologically preparing the troops for the likelihood that they would soon be called on to repress the Chilean civilian population. The generals who were involved in the coup needed to know what the reaction was going to be, who was going to be hesitant to actually join in that sort of repression, who, what the reaction in the civilian population was likely to be. It was about getting everybody acclimatized to the idea of seeing the army on the streets carrying out raids and arrests, and to gauge the level of preparation to prevent a coup, which, by this point, pretty much everybody expected was likely to happen. Now, the other thing that I find quite problematic in this tweet, and I want to, and this is what I'm going to be doing a bit of a deep dive into here, is this idea, this downplaying of the role of the CIA and the U.S. in the coup. Now, it's true that the U.S. and the CIA were not alone in this. There was a local well, oligarchy, there still is. They won what Patricio Guzman in his great documentary, which you should watch, called La Batalla de Chile, Guerra de un Pueblo Sin Armas, the Battle of Chile, the War of a People Without Weapons. There is, there was, and is this extremely incestuous oligarchy, basically carve up the entire country amongst themselves, and they were utterly shitting themselves at the fact that Allende had ended up winning an election. So they were going to, obviously they were going to do what they could to sabotage an Allende government no matter what. So the CIA weren't alone in this. Nor were the very real and disastrous strategic failures of the Unidad Popular government alone in this. But we really do have to focus, especially for those people who are in the U.S., which continues to carry out operations like this, with varying degrees of success and humiliating failure, we should not be downplaying this, because at every step of the way, the U.S. was intimately involved in these coup plots. Now, the role of the U.S. begins well before Allende was actually elected. In the previous presidential elections, the U.S. was heavily pouring money into the Christian Democrat Party, who were sort of liberal reformists with, you know, some fairly progressive people on the far left end of them. But 
basically fall they were seen as the way to sort of stave off any call for radical change and they actually did carry out some reforms that ultimately were deepened under Allende now but the so the US saw them very much as the way to avoid any kind of radical change in Chile particularly to head off Allende's perennial candidacy so they dumped money into the coffers of the Christian Democrats and created really, really just utterly over-the-top crass propaganda about how if Allende gets in, communists will be taking your children away. Most of it was actually just plagiarized from their earlier efforts in Italy. So that's, that sets the stage. The U.S. Well already had a policy of sabotaging Allende's chances at the polls, as they did not like the sort of forces that were coming up behind him, who were talking about things like nationalizing Chile's huge copper reserves and the entire mining industry, which is essentially you know, the Chilean economy and was at the time and really is, again now, basically sort of a buffet for foreign corporations, especially U.S. and Canadian interests. So then fl fast forward up to 1970. Allende comes out with the most votes. However, he did not have an outright majority. The way it worked, under the 1925 constitution that existed at that time was that if no presidential candidate gets an absolute majority, then the Senate gets into it. The Senate then have to vote in sort of a very small second round to decide who is actually going to be president. Now, when, when Allende came out with the most votes, the mood in Washington was one of just massive bedshitting. Nixon, I mean, you have to read these. We have a declassified record. I mean, it's probably the U.S intervention, to use a ridiculous euphemism in Latin America, that we have the best documentary record on of all of them. I mean, and what we see is in 1970, September 1970, Nixon is absolutely beside himself. This is the huge crisis in Latin America that uh, Allende's government got, uh, you know, won the first round of the elections, and it came on top of the first round of the elections, I should say. And it was considered an absolute priority to find some way to prevent him actually taking office, because that was going to be absolute catastrophe. Kissinger was worried that actually it was going to have a, a domino effect all the way over to the south of Italy, where the U.S. had sabotaged an election in order to prevent the Communist Party winning just, um, what, 22 years before. So they st uh, so wheels end up in motion, and there are two basic tracks to this whole plan to stop Allende taking office. It was sort of a subtle track, and a very not subtle track. The first track was that they were going to try to convince Christian Democrat senators, by which I mean bribe Christian Democrat senators, to vote for Radomiro Tomic, their candidate who'd come in. So the idea was that the uh, Christian Democrat senators were being asked and bribed to vote for their candidate to win the election, to win the election in the second round, even though he came in third with 28.08% of the vote. That's, uh, Rado, their candidate was Radomiro Tomic. He even did worse than the fascists that time, Jorge Alessandri, who, whose, I think, grandson, I'm not sure, defi uh, definitely a relative, because that's kind of how it works in Chilean politics, is currently mayor of Santiago. Now, the D.C. for the most part, the Democracia Cristiana, I'm just going to call him D.C. sometimes, as I'm used to saying, DC, did, they weren't exactly enamored with Allende either, although there was a left wing to them in the party. The left wing of the party actually had some time for Allende, but um, the party as a whole thought he was a fucking disaster as well. 
But the thing is, they knew that they would be utterly discrediting themselves if they went along with this scheme, where the idea was that if Tomic were pronounced the winner by the Senate, he would immediately step down and force new elections. And they just, they did not want to lose their credibility on this hill. So there was another track. This did not require quite as much support. And the idea here was to abduct the chief of staff of the Chilean army, a respected general by the name of René Schneider. Schneider was known as a strict constitutionalist in Chilean parlance at the time, which meant he did not support any kind of military involvement in party politics. He felt the military's job was to obey the elected government, whoever that was, and basta. So, the plot was that Schneider would be abducted. A fake far-left group would then claim responsibility, and this would create a climate where the military would be willing to intervene, since one of their top non-interventionists had just been targeted by a supposed left-wing group, and this would create a situation where everybody would see that it was absolute da absolute madness to, to let Allende win an election that he had come out with the most votes in. Yeah, that, that didn't work either. Schneider had his sidearm on him when they came to grab him. So uh, he took a shot at his abductors, and they shot him back and killed him. They didn't have any time to set up this fake left group that was going to claim responsibility. At that point, all they wanted to do was get the fuck out of there before anyone noticed. And... The result of this, since it was obvious the only people who would benefit from getting rid of a non-interventionist, constitutionalist general like Schneider, were the far right. And that's exactly where this suspicion ended up falling. Now, the thing to remember is this. The kidnappers, they were Chilean. However, the weapons were smuggled through the U.S. Embassy. The plan was also created in it was made the plan was also made in usa and pretty much everywhere you see the chilean right wing in 1970 to 1973 trying to sabotage the government you can always find the u.s behind them helping them along the way this is the pattern that you will see they would be doing it anyway because this was the country they basically owned they had the rug being pulled out of, from under them they weren't going to go without a fight one way or another, but they were certainly happy for any kind of support that was available. For the plan to bribe Christian Democrat senators into um, basically throwing the election and forcing a by-election was a disaster. The attempt to abduct an, uh, René Schneider which ultimately resulted in him being assassinated, completely backfired and created a climate where it had to be Allende because it was all about showing the far right that the Constitution would be respected and that the military was on side with whoever the elected government was. So Allende ends up in office. At this point, the U.S. kind of switches over, and we've got, if you want to read the documentary history of this, if you want to see the record, I recommend, there's a great group out of uh, George Washington University called the National Security Archive. And what they do is they just yeah, are just sort of machine gunning FOIA requests at all the major government agencies about all sorts of matters of significant historical importance. And they then publish the stuff that they get. And it's really interesting stuff. I mean, there's a... Google National Security Archive, you'll find documents on all sorts of things. It's great. It's a wonderful resource. But on Chile, they took all the documents that they had obtained and that were declassified by the Clinton administration in a token gesture to transparency. And Peter Kornblu edited together a book called The Pinochet File, a Dossier on Atrocity and Accountability, where you can find all of this record. And I mean, there's uh, there's also, there's more stuff, but this is a pretty comprehensive thing. If you want to see what um, Washington was saying internally and what kind of involvement they had, it's a great resource. 
So, at this point, the U.S. settles into kind of a long game. They realize they're not, there's not going to be any kind of short-term solution that gets rid of Allende and puts somebody they like into power. Now, one of the things that happens at this point is Agustin Edwards, one of, um, a scion of one of Chile's most influential families and the owner of El Mercurio, Chile's leading newspaper and also staunchly right-wing, he travels up to Washington for a meeting with top officials, and they talk to him about using his newspaper as a um, vehicle for right-wing propaganda, which is basically what it already was, so there wasn't planting stories that um, make Allende look bad and sort of stuff like that, which they were going to do that. They were going to do that anyway. This was... This was what the Mercurio did. There's a reason that a common slogan at protests well before Allende came in was El Mercurio miente. The Mercurio lies. Because this was like this was what they this was their business model. They were always going to be putting planting ridiculous right wing propaganda against a government like Allende. But so, but um, Agustin Edwards, he was, uh, you know, was a fairly enterprising fellow, uh, and so he says, "Look, we're going to. Th this is going to be expensive for us to basically do what we were going to fucking do anyway, and we're going to need some help." And he solicits and receives a contribution from the U.S. government that, in today's values, is about eleven million bucks just in support of him publishing anti-Allende propaganda, which he was going to fucking do anyway. Now, at the same time, the Chilean ruling class were involved in an all-out capital strike, and the model of their capital strike has been repeated pretty much everywhere that some kind of social democratic government has been elected in Latin America since. I mean, the main thing was... Again, they had put price controls on all sorts of basic necessities. So they immediately started channeling all the basic necessities away from retail, where they would have to sell them affordably, and onto the black market where they, you know, they could charge whatever the hell they wanted, and it would not benefit poor people. You know, they did lockouts, shut down production in places, and in general tried to create a situation of just economic chaos. The U.S. augmented this by a plan to do what in one document is called, uh, termed as make the economy scream. They put a, they, um, the, Chile had some IMF debt rescheduling that had already been agreed to under the prior government. Not anymore. Nixon nixed it, so to speak. It was, uh, there was not going to be any IMF debt scheduling, uh, rescheduling, and that was fairly essential to even being able to have a functioning government. They needed the rescheduling just to be able to cover running expenses. So that gets denied. Then the U.S. imposes a de facto embargo. So pretty much none of the things that they need to import in Chile in order to just keep functioning, spare parts and all sorts of other things like that, become almost unobtainable. Now... Just as in Q the case of Cuba, this had an additional propaganda benefit as far as the U.S. was concerned, since basically nobody except the Soviet Union was willing to defy the U.S. and provide any kind of assistance. They were knowingly and really deliberately forcing Chile, as they had done with Cuba previously, to seek assistance from the Soviet Union, which of course provides a handy little retrospective justification for all the shit they'd been doing in the first place and all their scaremongering around Allende. Now, this attack on the economy continued for three years, the entire time, and of course it was all completely blamed on the government because the idea was that there were midterm elections, midterm type elections are seen pretty much everywhere, sort of a referendum on the current government. And the idea was that people would see, would blame all this economic disaster that was being deliberately created both by a capital strike and by the U.S. from outside on the government and would then give the right-wingers and the Christian Democrats who were sort of 
again, centrist liberals who were, of course, willing to work with the openly fascist Partido Nacional, an overwhelming majority, and they could impeach again. They needed, they needed two-thirds. So there's a general election, parliamentary election, in 1973. And they, were, you know, they went into this, the right-wingers went into this with just absolute confidence. They were sure that, this was, uh, that their whole thing was going to work, and they were going to impeach again, and it would be the absolute, just the end to all this idea of you know, nationalizing major economic assets, of, you know, democratizing the society in any way, and this whole idea that, you know, working people should have their interests in any way represented in government. And that didn't happen. Again, this coalition, the Unidad Popular, they're made up of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the um, Christian left... Um, and various other the smaller parties, the Radical Party and a bunch of others, it's a very long list of mostly smaller parties, did something that had never actually happened before. They increased their electoral support while in government. No other Chilean governing party had ever managed that. So now they still ended up with a minority in the Congress, but they denied the right-wingers the two-thirds majority they needed to impeach Allende. So instead, what they just did, and this is a good example of what an opposition party can do in a legislature when they actually want to sabotage a government rather than just sort of pretending to be a resistance, like um, certain fucking Democrats. They just basically blocked every single legislative initiative. That had not previously been the case. Like when um, Allende proposed to nationalize the copper, the vote in Congress for that was unanimous. Everybody signed on to that. That was just, the mo that was extremely popular. It was the one moment where you could, where there was any kind of functioning support across parties for anything that he was doing. At this point, all sorts of just basic things that were central to the government's manifesto and things that were just central to being able to function at all you start getting voted down by the shrunken majority in Congress, the right-wing parties and the Christian Democrats, who are increasingly just an, another fascist party at this point. They, uh, they've basically, at this point, thrown their lot in completely with the fascists. The, so, essentially, the government becomes incapable of getting anything done that requires congressional involvement. They start a constant barrage of impeachment proceedings against leading ministers. Every One minister after another is suddenly in impeachment proceedings, which are mostly used to harass the ministers so that they can't actually do anything because they have to go and testify, or they have to send people to testify. And there was this complete campaign of just to make it impossible for the government to function. In this context, things like the Arms Control Act that I mentioned earlier get passed in circumstances where there was no veto power for the government. At the same time, you have this massive attack on the economy, but... Uh, the right wing in Chile and the U.S. both realize, because of this electoral result, that there's not going to be a lawful way to get rid of Allende. They can't really count on elections to do what they're supposed to. Immediately, all the energy starts getting put. So now all the energy starts moving in the direction of just a straight up military coup in which the U.S. was also intimately involved. That included providing logistical support on the eve of the coup, for example. From the start of Allende's government, the U.S. kept on smuggling in significant numbers, unusual numbers, of senior military officers. They had to declare this to the Chilean authorities, of course, and they always claimed that it was just military musicians. Even at the time, the Chilean authorities were a little bit surprised that these military musicians were all 
senior officers, majors and above. The U.S. was also smuggling weapons and cash into, through the embassy in order to assist in efforts to overthrow the government. On the eve of the coup, in Valparaíso, which is a major Chilean port city, which is also the traditional center of Chilean naval life, the Navy being the most right-wing segment of the armed forces there, and one of the early adopters when it came to the coup. In Valparaíso, on the eve of the coup, there was a significant U.S. military contingent right there. Ostensibly, they were there because of the joint UNITAS naval exercises, but they were in fact providing logistical support for the coup. That went so far as assisting in the provision of hit lists. This last bit, we happen to know in large part thanks to investigations into the murder of a U.S. journalist who was a supporter of Allende and was living in Santiago by the name of Charlie Horman. There's a really good movie a fictionalization by Costa Gavras called Missing about it, and it actually, it's, I recommend it. It's, um, it holds up very well to what we know from subsequent investigations. Charlie! Char my husband? My esposa? Did you see my husband? Did you find out anything in Washington? No, but, um... Putnam there seems to think that things down here are in pretty good hands. You don't agree? Don't expect a whole hell of a lot anymore. He's been gone two weeks. They give me the same song and dance over and over again. They don't give a goddamn about him. Oh, look, really, I don't want to hear any of your anti-establishment paranoia. You know damn well he's not in hiding. Our whole neighborhood saw him picked up by a goon squad. I asked him for a list of Charles Frank. What are you doing down here? Well, the Navy sent me down here to do a job, and uh, she's done. Well, there's my man from Mill Group. Mill Group? What's Mill Group? Mill Group's just U.S. military group. <laughs> Ed, all those American officials in Vina were probably involved in the coup. Mr. Harmon, there's another theory kicking around, that your son was picked up by leftists posing as soldiers. I mean, he could have done it, too embarrass the government to make it look like they're arresting Americans. They are arresting Americans. Or don't David Sorry, Holloway and Frank Taruji count? Mrs. Warm. Frank, you're not asleep yet? Look around. Shh. Don't be a nudist, but around. David Holloway? Holloway. Don't be a Frank Taruji. We have to break the floor in the sink. They can't kill us. Our embassy will go bananas. Taruji? the last time I ever saw Frank. The State Department told me that Frank left here as soon as he got out. I spoke to Frank's dad in Chicago, and Frank never called him or anyone else we know. You suggested that there might be some kind of American police assistance program down here? I'd like you to know that nothing of that sort exists in this country. That I brought it up only because I want you to use every resource at your command. No such operation exists. I just want my boy back. There were four of them in Lutz's office. The general, of course, the colonel, my friend who told me of this, and, and the American officer. Who's the American officer in the room? The ministry is full of them. The mill group office is just down the hall from the general. That they call the prisoner by name? Horseman. Horman? He said the man must disappear. He knew too much. What could Charles know that's so important? Probably what he discovered in Vigna. You say you kept notes. Uh-huh. You still have them? Yeah, at the hotel. The coup went very smoothly. Was it planned very far in advance? There's a bear shit in the woods. How do you feel about the coup? Very good. The boss of Mill Group and the senior political officer both happened to be in Vigna when the coup started. I have a friend. He thinks your son was executed in the National Stadium on September 19th. I think we may have some good news for oh, you. Oh, what would that be? That my son was executed in the stadium three days after his arrest. I do not think that they would dare do a thing like that unless an American official co-signed a kill order. Why would we want him dead? Probably because he knew of our involvement in the coup. 
We're not involved, Mr. Harmon. Oh. Our position has been completely neutral. That is a bald-faced lie. I don't know what happened to your kid, Ed, but I understand he was a bit of a snoop. You play with fire. You get burned. Hello? I looked into that, uh, Ed, and as we've been informed that uh, the body has been identified. I'm going to sue Ed, everybody who let that boy die. Now, here, at the time, Charlie Horman was heavily into investigating the U.S. role in the assassination of General Schneider. Now, a family friend came to visit in the early September 1973, and, and she and Charlie Horman went up to Valparaiso, which is just about an hour and a half north of Santiago, so, they, so that she could see the seaside, see Viña del Mar. It really is a lovely city if you ignore all of the dog shit, of which there's a fair bit. But other than that, beautiful place, great place, and popular for sightseeing. Very nice sea lions. So, he, so they go up there, and they get stuck. The coup happens while they're up there. They're stranded without any money. They have no way to, uh, the phone lines are cut, so they have no way to phone back to Santiago's, and they have no place to stay. They were planning, they were only going to be there for the day. So, they managed to get some money. The British consulate, the U.S. consulate, wanted nothing to do with them. But a British honorary consul gave them some money so they could get into a hotel in which they found themselves surrounded by senior U.S. military officers. Now, being a very curious sort, Charlie Horman starts asking him about the coup. And they assumed, it seems, that being from the U.S., he was on side with whatever they were doing. So they were actually pretty mask off about their role and their support for it. We know this because of copious notes and because of witness testimony. A couple of days later, he's finally able, he and the the friend is finally able to get back to Santiago. And within a couple more days, he vanishes without a trace. Now, the U.S. Embassy made a show of trying to look for him. His father actually came down from, he came down from New York to assist in the search and they were just completely given the runaround until they just happened to find his body in have it, that had been buried unidentified. Conveniently, it was then held for six months, so it was impossible to do a proper autopsy. Now, the Horman family, and also the Teruji family, family of an, another U.S. citizen who was a supporter of the Allende government, also a friend of the Hormans, by the name of Frank Teruji, who also was disappeared in very much the same way. Both spent decades trying in the U.S. courts to get some kind of answers about what exactly happened to Charlie Horman and Frank Teruji. Because there was a very strong suspicion, for good reason, that the U.S. Embassy knew a hell of a lot more than they were saying. Forty, for 40 years, basically, nothing was able to happen with this. It kept on, the cases kept on getting kicked because it was a state secret, or something like that. Eventually, they gave up on the U.S. courts altogether, and apparently realizing that in Chile there would be copies of any of these documents, you know, any correspondence between the U.S. government and the dictatorship would have copies both in the U.S. and in Chile. So, they started a um, criminal action in a uh, Chilean court and before a, an investigative magistrate by the name of Cepeda. And in uh, 2015, it was confirmed that the U.S. Embassy had forwarded the FBI files of both Charlie Horman and Frank Teruji to Chilean military uh, Intelligence. These were COINTEL profiles that specifically identified them as subversives. Now, anyone who handed those th those files over to Chilean military intelligence, who at the time were killing and torturing hundreds and hundreds of people, just littering the, the streets with bodies at the time, knew they were signing. The, that was tantamount to putting out a hit on them. 
there was no reason you would actually hand that file over to Chilean military intelligence unless you did not want that person to be able to get back alive. My point is this. If the U.S. was forwarding COINTEL profiles on their own citizens to Chilean military intelligence, knowing that this was going to get them killed, because they had to know, uh, there's no way that that was the only time they did that. That They were all over Chile at the time, uh, during the Allende years. They were paying very close attention to his supporters. Where there's one file, there, uh, where there's one file being transferred over from the embassy to Chilean military intelligence, there's undoubtedly quite a few more. They had... Uh, during, especially during those first few months, the relationship was extremely close. The, Pinochet, the Junta, Pinochet only really took over outright a couple of years in. At the time, initially it was a Junta, supposedly equally representing all branches of the armed forces, including the military police, Carabineros. The relationship was extremely close. They were totally dependent on the U.S. to run interference internationally and to um, suddenly release development loans that had been held up for three years under Allende, to do all sorts of things in order to make sure that they were able to consolidate their power. So... When we talk about the U, and when we when somebody says it was the CIA, I mean we should not be downplaying that role. There is a lot. The Chilean local ruling class did plenty, and the strategic incompetence of left electoralism did quite a bit as well. Again, it was really quite distrustful of any initiative to stop the coup that came from below. He was obsessed with uh, maintaining a record of strict compliance with applicable law and the Constitution. Indeed, I mean, the Constitution he died for. He, he was probably the very last believer in the 1925 Constitution, which itself was an absolute fraud, but that's a story for another day. They most important initiatives to put a stop to the economic sabotage, the capital strike, came from a movement called Poder Popular, People's Power. And, the, and this was just working class people who were organizing in their neighborhoods and their workplaces to combat the sabotage where they saw it. So they would do things like if they found hordes of, of basic goods that were being diverted to the black market, they would expose that and then distribute them for free. Uh, when the owner-operators started striking all over the place, basically making it impossible for anyone to get anywhere, these were right-wing strikes that were very directly supported financially by the U.S. as well. And they organized alternative forms of transport, uh, did all sorts of things like this. They were... Real, it's really one of the most remarkable things that happened in the period, and Allende found them totally enervating because he came he was he came from the upper class. He was part. Of, he was born into the political class, really, and his whole understanding of how this was going to work is that he, as the representative of the Chilean working class, would be able to negotiate some sort of honorable deal with all these other gentlemen from the ruling class who were on the other side. The idea that there would be any kind of initiative from the working class itself was really alien to his con uh, concept of how things worked. I mean, it was the same thing with some of the most promising attempts to prevent the coup. For example, I'm going to try to include some recommended reading on this. Most of it is in Spanish, but... Um, in the description, the Chilean Navy, as I mentioned, was very much the epicenter of coup activity in Chile. They were, the, they were and are the most right-wing segment of the armed forces, 
their entire relationship between officers and enlisted personnel is positively medieval, even compared to the Chilean Air Force and the Chilean Army. So, when Allende won the election, the officers were crestfallen. On the other hand, a lot of the enlisted people in the Navy were celebrating. In fact, according to a lot of um, oral history that's been taken, people were celebrating not so much because they'd followed politics all that much. The military w members were not allowed to vote as part of maintaining the political neutrality of the armed forces. But the fact that the officers hated this guy was enough for them to think that he might be worthwhile. And, of course, the officers had to, when they decided to get involved in plotting a coup, they had to psychologically prepare the enlisted people who were actually going to have to do all the dirty work. And so they started, you know, haranguing uh, enlisted people uh, at, all over the place, telling them to get ready to be ready to overthrow this Marxist government or whatever. And... So some of the more committed supporters of the elected government within the enlisted personnel of the Navy, various petty officers and just and seamen, decided started meeting and decided that they really needed to do something to stop this. They were fairly certain that Valparaíso would be essential and the Navy would be essential to any coup effort. And so they started to work out a plan very tentatively, very quietly, because they knew that they were being spied on. They knew that what they were doing was technically illegal. So, but ultimately they came up with a plan. They, which involved taking over a couple of ships and then using them to face down any naval vessels that were going to be involved in the coup. They... Want, however, and this was their downfall, really, they wanted approval from above. They didn't want to just do this on their own steam. They wanted official cover. So they tried to contact the government. The government won't return their calls. Eventually, Carlos Altamirano, a senator for the Socialist Party and a close associate of Allende, some who also had been on the record saying that... Um, Soldiers should disobey their officers if their officers call on them to launch a coup against the elected government. There was, there was reason to believe that this guy would listen to them. And he did hear them out, and he basically blew them off. Said, you know, this will, uh, the optics of this thing just won't be good. The right wing will absolutely love it. Uh, they'll use it to show that the government is acting against the law or whatever, and that's going to cause a coup. Uh, this just shows the strategic bubble that the government was in when it came to the coup, because at this point, the coup was going to happen one way or another. It was a done deal. The only question was who was going to win. And here these, here these petty officers and seamen get together at great risk to themselves to figure out a way to make sure that the government can withstand a coup. And the government tells them to piss off because they don't like the optics. And this is just one of various examples of how this top-down attitude, not just within the government, but amongst government supporters, made it possible for the coup to succeed, even though it probably didn't have to. But we really cannot downplay, especially those of us who are in or from the U.S., cannot be downplaying the extremely important role that the U.S. played in making this happen, especially because the U.S. has not stopped doing this. Uh, they, did, uh, they did it just recently in Bolivia. They've been attempting to do it in Venezuela. This has been going on for a very long time, and it's still going on now. And on that cheery note, if you found this content worthwhile, I invite you to like and subscribe, and I'm always happy to see new supporters on my Patreon, so uh, have a good start of your week.
I look forward to seeing you here again. And take a moment, pop over to Thought Slime's Twitter, uh, Twitter feed if you're on Twitter, and retweet his call on YouTube to reinstate his video about YouTube's failure to enforce their policy on online harassment, which has now been taken down after a fascist mass reporting action. He's had a guideline strike over it. There is a, um, there's a specific thread he's got that he's asking people to retweet. So just take a moment, go over there and retweet that because we need maximum visibility. We can't stand for these attacks on anybody. Have a, as good a week as it's possible to have under the, these fucking circumstances.